are in Santa Cruz and online at kpfa.org. Please stay tuned for your own health and fitness. Welcome to your own health and fitness. I'm Lena Berman. Jeff Fawcett and I come to you weekly with a critical, independent voice on the politics and practice of health and the environment. On my seventh birthday, I was supposed to go with friends to a movie I desperately wanted to see. Instead, I stayed home with the measles. What a drag. What I didn't know then, but know now, is that I have a lifetime immunity which on my seventh birthday I couldn't have cared less about. If I were turning seven today, I'd get to go to that movie because I'd have been vaccinated against the measles and a host of other childhood diseases that were common when I was a kid. However, the immunity would not be for a lifetime, but for significantly less, requiring me to get periodic boosters to maintain my immunity, about which, at seven years old, I probably couldn't care less. I'm at the movies. At the same time, although less likely to get measles, I'd be more likely to have a wide variety of chronic illnesses, such as asthma, that are unquestionably the result of a damaged immune system, and a wide variety of other illnesses, such as autism, that are controversially the result of a damaged immune system. Both kinds rare when I was seven, far rarer than they are now. Since vaccines are designed to intervene in the work of the immune system, you'd think that some scientific effort would be made to make sure there wasn't a relationship between vaccination and the dramatic increase in childhood illness. There has not. My guest today is Thomas Cowan, MD, a veteran family physician who has studied and written about many subjects in medicine, including nutrition, homeopathy, anthroposophical medicine, and herbal medicine. He is the author of Vaccines, Autoimmunity, and the Changing Nature of Childhood Illness. He is also a founding board member of the Weston A. Price Foundation. The problem you address in your book, Vaccines, Autoimmunity, and the Changing Nature of Childhood Illness, focuses on the increasing prevalence and incidence of chronic and particularly autoimmune diseases. Talk to us a little bit, to, just to start off, how big this problem is and just what the scope of it is. Just first of all, thank you for taking the time to have me on your show here. And You know, it depends a little bit on what you call autoimmune disease. And I used, I must admit, a kind of broad definition, meaning any uh, illness that has an immunological basis. So I would include things like allergies and food allergies and peanut allergies and eczema. And then all the classic autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis and lupus and Hashimoto's and Crohn's disease. And if you talk about all those, we're probably talking about over 100 million people in the United States. And I often, when I speak to groups, I always like it if there's people at least as old as I am in the group, because I ask them, how many children do you know, do you remember from elementary school who had food allergies and peanut allergies and eczema and asthma and I know that I remember one in our elementary school. And I mean, I'm old, but not that old. (laughs) And and now I've heard numbers like 40% of the children in Detroit public schools uh, are on at least one uh, daily prescription medicine. So we have a hugely different incidence of disease in this country And up to and including neurodevelopmental issues like tics and seizures and autism and all that. Whereas it used to be uh, in the 60s, it was something like one in 10,000 children. And the latest CDC numbers were one in 35. So we, we have a hugely different population and type of illness than we did even one or two generations ago, which in my mind, means 
it can't possibly be genetic. Yes, that's one of the things that seems kind of obvious to me, even though that is very popular to attribute things to genetics. And yes. you're quite right, I, I think. That's not how genetics works, or at least the evolution of these things. One of the things that uh, you're, you're referring to is the incidence in, ch- in childhood illness. But what this implies for me is that these conditions do not naturally reverse themselves as children mature, so that it is... In addition to the suffering in childhood, there is the suffering throughout life from these conditions because they just don't go away. Right. Um, convention. One of the points you uh, you make and you you just uh, alluded to is that conventional medicine really doesn't have an explanation for this dramatic rise in these diseases, these conditions. And what you're proposing in this book is less, as you say qu- quite clearly at the beginning of the book, less a critique of vaccines per se as the attempt to develop a theory, an explanation of why these illnesses are arising with such dramatic increases and to offer an explanation. So just to kind of orient us, uh, we're going to get into the details here in a little bit, but just to orient us, give us an overview of what you think the explanation of this rise is. If you would permit me to take a few minutes to give an overview, I think that would be the best way to at least explain myself. So when people come to me and they say, I want help with my immune system, the first thing I point out is we don't have an immune system. We have at least two immune systems. And in order to understand anything about this situation, we have to understand this point very clearly. Uh, So... If, if you take the example of, say, uh, encountering a viral infection, let's use chicken pox as an example. So if you're a person who's what's called naive to chicken pox, meaning you've never encountered the virus before, let's say you're a four-year-old child. So what happens is the chicken pox virus gets into your tissues, into your mucous membranes of your nose and throat and mouth and and even bronchial tubes, and it actually infects hundreds, thousands, maybe even millions of cells. So at that point, you now have all these, um, you know, untold number of cells who have a virus inside them, and they're because of that, they're not functional, and the body says to itself, I need to clear these dysfunctional cells out of my body. It does that by stimulating what's called a cell-mediated response. Cell-mediated response means it refers to its, it's based in the activity of the white blood cells in the body. So some people, I don't particularly like this image so much, but it's like this sort of Pac-Man thing where <laughs> the white blood cells are recruited to the area of the dead or, or uh, infected cells. They're not dead. They... Uh, the white blood cells essentially chew up, digest, and then excrete these uh, infected dysfunctional cells out of the body. And here comes the most important point of this part. It's the activity of the cell-mediated immune system, which we people call as being sick. In other words, it's not the virus that makes you sick. It's the attempt to eliminate the virus that makes you sick. And the reason I know that is because you can infect somebody with chickenpox and then give them a medicine like prednisone to stop their cell-mediated reaction, and they will never have the symptoms of chickenpox. They won't have fever. They won't have mucus. They won't have rash. They won't have a cough. They could die from the infection, but they won't be, quote, sick. And on the other hand, you can stimulate the cell-mediated reaction with no virus needed, and the person will be what we call sick. Sick meaning fever, rash, mucus, cough, snot, etc. So that cell-mediated reaction happens for 7 to 10 days, at which time you've now cleared yourself of these infected cells, and you can reconstitute new, more healthy cells after that. 
And we use a very interesting word to describe people like that. We say they're now better, meaning they're actually better than they were when they started. So then the second part of the immune system happens. And the second part called the humoral or antibody-based immune system is there because if we didn't have a humoral part, we would get sick from chickenpox or whatever, any other virus, over and over and over again, and life would be a drag. So we have a so-called memory arm, which means that you make antibodies to a certain piece of the chickenpox so that if you ever encounter that same virus again, your body remembers it, it makes antibodies that neutralize it, And that neutralization happens without getting the cell-mediated immune system involved. And the second important point of this is the activity of the humoral immune system gives the person no experience of being sick. In other words, there's no symptoms. You don't know that it's happening. You make antibodies. It takes usually six to eight weeks. And then when those two things happen in that order... First, clear the virus with the cell mediated and then uh, remember it with the antibody arm. You will be immune for life almost 100% of the time. It's an incredibly well-evolved, foolproof system, but only if those two things happen. And again, the cell mediated part is the part that makes us feel sick. It's the part that has symptoms. It's the part that's the elimination of debris and infected cells and, you know, tissue that's been uh, destroyed. The second part is the memory arm. And when they work together, you're immune for life. Okay. Now, given that framework, what exactly is your argument? Because vaccines are portrayed as medical miracles. What is your your theory, your explanation of what goes wrong in that system that makes vaccines the causal factor in creating this rise in these chronic and autoimmune diseases? The first thing I would say about that is, by and large, those two thing, those two immune responses happened in that order with every single infectious disease that we encountered until the, the, the introduction of vaccines. Now, the whole the- so leaving aside the, the miracle part, let's just talk, <laughs> let's just talk about what the theory of vaccineology is. And it's very clear, and of this there's no dispute. The theory is we don't want the cell-mediated part because that's what makes people sick. That's what's dangerous. Uh, We want to engineer the vaccines so that they only create a humoral or antibody response with as little cell-mediated response as possible. Now, there are some differences with the vaccines, one versus the other, but basically that's the theory. We want to make the person make antibodies to the chickenpox part, but we don't want them to go through the cell mediated part. So the repercussion. So, so there is this. Excuse me for interrupting, but just to emphasize this, the the intent is to prevent suffering. That's the the miracle part. You you can be yes. you can be protected without feeling awful. Right. So that's the theory. So in a sense, that's how they're engineered now. The first thing I would point out is that the definition of an autoimmune disease, so if you talk about uh, what is the definition of Hashimoto's, that's an autoimmune disease that, that destroys your thyroid. We're told that 30 to 40, 40 million people, mostly women in this country, have this. The definition is elevated antibodies in the blood. What's the definition of rheumatoid arthritis, another autoimmune disease that affects millions of people? We have the definition is elevated antibodies in the blood. If you have peanut allergies, which didn't happen in the 50s and is a large number of people now, you have antibodies to peanuts in the blood. Same with milk proteins. You have antibodies to peanut to milk in the blood. So the question is, How come we ended up with all these people with elevated antibodies in the blood? Now, I would admit that I've sometimes accused of being 
been accused of being a smart aleck. But the answer, at least partly, is that's the entire intention of the vaccine program is to elevate the antibodies in the blood. So apparently it worked. You're listening to Your Own Health and Fitness. I'm Jeffrey Fawcett. I'm talking today with Thomas Cowan, MD, about what explains the dramatic rise of autoimmune diseases and chronic illness in children. Back to the interview. Now, I would say that that the reason for this is, and, and if you get into how do you make a vaccine, so some people would say, well, you take the antigenic, meaning the antibody stimulating part of the chickenpox virus, you mix it with salt water and a preservative like vitamin C, and you inject that in the person, and then they'll make antibodies against that, part, that antigenic part of the chickenpox. The problem is, if you take that combination, chickenpox, antigen, normal saline, salt water, vitamin C, the body won't make antibodies. So you have to put an adjuvant, which is a word that means helper, which is a nonspecific toxic substance. Why toxic? Because it has to be toxic. Because otherwise your body won't recognize it as something that that has stimulated antibody production. So usually they use things like aluminum and there's formaldehyde and all kinds of things that are called adjuvants, which are there to stimulate on a broad scale antibody production. So if there's peanut proteins, which there are in vaccines, if there's milk proteins, which there are, if there's human DNA, which there is in vaccines, you will not just make antibodies to the chickenpox virus. You will make antibodies to whatever is in the vaccine, plus whatever is maybe that you've ingested or whatever part of your body is inflamed that has antigens. And the, the, the end result of this is you put people into a elevated antibody state. Now, I would point out that I am not the first one or the only one who's pointed this out or made this connection. There are literally scores of, of cases and studies and uh, trials showing elevated autoimmune reactivity as a result of vaccines. And I could even read the, a quote from a guy named Yehuda Schoenfeld, who's the editor of the Journal of Immunology and the co-editor of Allergy Research and Immunology, who says, throughout our lifetime, the normal immune system walks a fine line between preserving normal immune reactions and developing autoimmune disease. Uh, The healthy immune system is tolerant to self-antigens. When self-tolerance is disturbed, dysregulation of the immune system follows, resulting in emergence of autoimmune disease. Vaccination is one of the main conditions that disturbs this homeostasis in susceptible individuals, resulting in autoimmune phenomena in Asia. Asia stands for autoimmune syndrome induced by adjuvant. And he says there's 150 million people in the world suffering from Asia. Autoimmune syndrome induced by adjuvant, which is basically you've stimulated antibody production way, way more than is normal in people which then reacts against their self. That vaccines themselves are contaminated by these foreign proteins from uh, peanuts and milk and, and so on. And that sounds to me like a kind of production problem or a regulatory problem that I thought the FDA ensured that things that were injected into people were pure it's the Pure Food and Drug Act is the governing piece of legislation. So what happens there? Is this a production problem of actually how to create the vaccines so that the, the we, we get rid of the autoimmune response by purifying the vaccine? The problem is in order to make an antibody reaction, which is the goal of the vaccine, you have to put adjuvants in there that stimulate antibody reactions. 
And nobody thinks there is no theory that says putting aluminum and it's not that they're mean that the reason they put aluminum in there, they have to put aluminum in there in order to make you make antibodies. Nobody thinks that aluminum will only make you make antibodies to the chickenpox virus. There's no such theory like that. It will make you make antibodies to whatever you're exposed to, including possibly your own tissue, which has been shown, you know, very specifically in animal studies that if you uh, give them enough aluminum injections, that you will stimulate an autoimmune disease. It was shown in the the trials with uh, the Gardasil vaccine. They created in six months after using this uh, vaccine called Gardasil, 3.5% of the people developed an autoimmune disease. Now, interestingly, they had a placebo group with that that also had 3.5% autoimmune disease development in the first six months. Uh, The problem was the, the placebo part of that also contained the same amount of aluminum because they said the active ingredient was the virus, not the aluminum, So because aluminum was part of the non-active ingredient, that could be included as the placebo. So they got the identical amount of autoimmune disease just from putting aluminum in the vaccine in the placebo and in the trial group. I have to ask, did anyone draw the obvious conclusion that, gee, maybe it's something about the base that we're using here that might be causing this incidence of autoimmune disease? Well, especially because the final part of that story was they did in the original, uh, you know, licensing trial for the, that particular vaccine. They did have a smaller group, about 950. I'm not sure that's the exact number, but it's around that. As, as a, the first two groups had about 12,000, so they were much bigger. And the, they did do a small group that had a, uh, a normal saline injection. So there was nothing in this. Uh, this this injection that was given to these 900 people. And none of them in the next six months developed an autoimmune disease. So they actually, one could look at that trial and say, the thing that caused the, the autoimmune disease was not the HPV viral antigen. It was the aluminum in the vaccine because they used the aluminum was the exact same milligrams. I think it was 225 milligrams in both the control and the active group, there was no aluminum, no no adjuvant of any sort in the saline group. None of them had it. Now, your question is, shouldn't that be obvious to the powers that be? Yes. And, you know, my typical answer to that is, I guess it was obvious to me. I think you should ask one of them. The problem is it's a recognized part of vaccine science to call the active ingredient to be the viral component, the antigen. The problem is nobody thinks, at least nobody that I know of, thinks it's the part of the chicken pox that causes overreactivity of the immune system. That's just not what, what the component that does. But for some reason, they're allowed, since that's the active ingredient in the, in the quote, medicine, they're allowed to, to put... The other inactive components are, are the same in the placebo and the active group. That's how they do it. I don't want to belabor this subject, but I think it's extremely important because what I've learned from reading a, a number of people keeping up with this topic, that one of the things that is a problem with just the general theory of immunity and how it works in the basis for use of vaccines is that the understanding of how the immune system develops has become much more relevant and completely undercuts the principal theory behind the use of vaccination, particularly of young children, that really a child's immune system is still developing. And one of the primary reasons for adding adjuvants for infant vaccinations up to like two to four years old is that the child's immune system won't respond to the presence of that antigen 
that provocative viral stimulant that they have to actually kick it into gear to do it. There's a problem here with just the theory of how immunity works and the basis of vaccination per se. And then there's how the vaccines are actually implemented. So if someone thinks, oh, well, we can get away with without adjuvants. And then, no, we can't get away. We have to have adjuvants, which is a way of short-circuiting how the immune system naturally works. Talk a little bit about those two sides of what's going wrong here. There's one that is based on a misunderstanding or a failure to uh, appreciate how the immune system actually develops, how it actually works. And in addition to that, the response to how they do it by the use of adjuvants to force the immune system to do something it wouldn't otherwise do is also a source of this explosion in autoimmune diseases. Right. It's it's so, exactly what I said. We have, I don't know how many hundreds, thousands, millions of years of evolution to have a two-step process that I described earlier. First cell mediated, first you clear the virus, then you remember it. That's the only way you get an active immune response that lasts for the life of the patient, and it's almost 100% foolproof. On the other hand, if you circumvent that by just doing an antibody response, A, that's, that causes a, a, essentially a wholesale dysfunction or a reorientation of the immune system, and B, it never lasts for the life of the patient. Which is, how do I know that? Because, we, you know, I'm old enough to remember we were told that a measles shot would last for life. You get it at 15 months, you'll be immune for life. And then we found out the hard way that what we, all we did was make people in their late teenage years and early adult years susceptible to measles when it's much more dangerous. And in fact, the bottom line is circumventing the cell-mediated part by giving adjuvant-based uh, uh, antigens never, ever creates immunity for life. It simply can't. We know with measles, the first one lasts maybe 10 to 12 years, subsequent ones two to three years. So in other words, all the 30 to 50-year-olds are no longer immune to measles, which makes the, the idea of herd immunity kind of a joke. Because we don't have herd immunity, because most of the people aren't immune, because they don't get measles shots every two to three years. But, and so what you're saying is, I mean, you put it very well, that we've, the theory of this, it doesn't take into account the long, long, long history of the development of this incredibly sophisticated immune response and that forces you to circumvent it or to do an abnormal intervention like giving a vax, uh, an adjuvant, which by definition has to be toxic. Otherwise, you don't get a reaction. And that creates a whole other set of problems. And besides, you have to grow the uh, viruses on biological medium. And uh, so you have to do it on you know, chicken eggs, which are always contaminated with retroviruses and other things. They grow them on fetal DNA. You know, they grow them on, on aborted fetal uh, heart tissue and lung tissue, and the antigens come out in there. And how do I know that? Because the, the, the founders and the directors of the vaccine program admit it. They say it. It's, it's you know, it, it's right. Clear as a bell. I'm going to take a brief musical break. When I come back, I'll continue talking with Thomas Cowan, MD, about his book, Vaccines, Autoimmunity, and the Changing Nature of Childhood Illness. Stick around. You're in the right place.
welcome back. This is Your Own Health and Fitness. I'm Jeffrey Fawcett. I'm talking today with Thomas Cowan, MD, about his book, Vaccines, Autoimmunity, and the Changing Nature of Childhood Illness. Our website, yourownhealthandfitness.org, has more information about this show as well as our almost 700 other shows, a free download of today's show, free open access to recordings of all our shows, and a, a free newsletter about upcoming shows and more. Back to the interview. One of the interesting things that you talk about is the beneficial effects of childhood diseases, which gets everyone worked up. How is it that a childhood illness, such as measles, is a good thing? So first of all, how do I know that? And I would refer people to Neil Miller's book called 400 Peer-Reviewed Studies on Vaccines, which you can get at Amazon. And there's approximately 30 or so um, uh, peer-reviewed studies in there documenting that children who get all these different childhood infectious diseases have less incidence of heart disease, glioblastoma, other forms of cancer, osteoarthritis, and basically all the diseases that are in increasing proportion in our adult population. So that's not a theory. That's just uh, population-based epidemiological studies have shown that. Um, so why is that? Uh, it's, it's a bit like, you know, if the way w- when we, we use our cell-mediated immune response to clear out viruses, debris, and all kinds of toxic substances from our body, when we do that, we make ourselves better, which is the word that we use, and therefore less susceptible to other chronic disease. Now, I I also pointed out in my book that one of the reasons I got into this was I learned about the dramatic success of something called Coley's toxins, which was um, which was used in the 1920s as the first and probably most successful therapy for particularly end stage cancer in the history of United States medicine. And this came about because a a osteosarcoma, which is a type of bone cancer surgeon, realized that the usual treatment for osteosarcoma, which was amputation of the whatever bone was involved, just didn't work. And the only person he ever saw who got better actually had erysipelas, which is a strep infection of the skin. And he had a high fever for four weeks, at which time at the end, end of that time, he was completely cured of his sarcoma and didn't come back for another decade or even after that. He then set off in the next number of decades to give people high fevers if they had cancer. And I was actually given a book by his daughter in the late 80s with literally thousands of documented cases, about 40 percent of which Uh, showed that the people with cancer were cured simply by giving them a high fever every day for four weeks. Uh, Interestingly, this actually inspired Sloan Kettering, which is one of the main uh, oncology centers in the world, to start their immunology program because one of their head immunologist cancer researchers, uh, as far as I know the story goes, married his granddaughter he know he knew about this. They started investigating how having infections somehow immunizes you against uh, diseases like cancer later in life, and they've been working on this for forty years. Now, the irony of this, even though they've well documented that fevers are your best defense against chronic disease. They are how your innate immune system or your cell-mediated immune system learns to grow and develop. Without allowing this cell-mediated reaction to happen, you are a setup for immunologically-based chronic diseases later in life. But, you know, it it's never ceases to amaze me that even though they know this and they've been researching this for 50 years, If you go in with an infection, they give you an antibiotic to stop it. They prevent infections every chance they get. 
and they don't seem to understand that there's a connection between uh, you need to go through these these exercises of your cell mediated response because cancer, after all, in some ways, is a failure of your cell mediated response. Yes, you have quite uh, sophisticated methods for tagging and eliminating cells that have gone crazy yes. in proliferating. And, and That's the cell mediated response yep. that does that. It's not the antibody response. Yep. And so. Cancer is a failure of the cell-mediated response. I don't think it's a stretch to therefore ask, well, how do we treat the cell-mediated response in the developing life of the child and the young adult? The answer is we stop it every chance we get. Yep, stomp on it. Stop it. Yes. Another and point that you made. I mean, we get what we, we – the predictable outcome. One of the points that you make in the book, the very first thing that happens if a child is brought in and they have a fever is they get the fever down before they even know anything about what's going on, evaluate the child's condition to figure out well, what actually is going on. No one ever asks the question, is fever the appropriate thing to, to do here? Everyone's been frightened by, oh, my God, the child has a fever. They're going to get brain damage or their kidneys are going to be destroyed or something horrible is going to happen. So we have to fight it valiantly, keep it in the cage, pound it down. It's the war on fever. It sounds like really what we need is to have a healthy respect for it, but understand what it is and what it's doing and that it actually is a good thing. Well, the first thing I would say is we have a lot of wars and we tend not to win any of them. Right. And this is one of them, and it's often just the same with many of our other wars. It's because we're not fighting the right enemy. Uh, again, you can look in the research, and any qualified doctor or pediatrician knows this. There is no evidence that the fever itself is harmful to the person. Now, I didn't say that a person with a fever can't come to harm, because they can but what I would say is a child with roseola and 105 is always safe, and a child with meningitis and a temperature of 99 is in dire straits. So it's not the height of the fever. It's the underlying issue that's the problem. We also know that the fever itself doesn't cause the harm. The meningitis might, or the other infection might, but the fever is the response and there are, it's a voluminous uh, body of evidence that if you suppress fevers, you prolong the illness and make worse outcomes over and over again. In fact, if you want to have a bad outcome with measles or one of the other in, uh, childhood diseases, the best strategy, and I'm not suggesting this, is to meticulously bring the fever down with Tylenol or Motrin and you will very much increase your odds of having a bad outcome. The fever is the body's therapeutic response. Even in some cases, as you pointed out, again, in some cases, not all cases, it's effective even with the worst disease we have, which is cancer. It's effective in arthritis. It's effective in a lot of other diseases as well. And there is tremendous literature support for this. Now, to your question, how do we in induce it? Well, we used to use Coley's toxins, which is injection of a certain part of the vac of the bacteria. You can use hyperthermia, which is not quite the same as the fever coming from your own activity. So it doesn't work as well. And we have very little knowledge of how to actually do that in spite of a quote from Hippocrates, the father of medicine, which was, Give me a fever, give me a medicine to produce a fever, and I can cure any disease. Can we say with any confidence that unvaccinated children are likely to be healthier than vaccinated children? Uh, so let me give you the only study that I know of uh, that actually looked into this. And this was a study, uh, it was in the Journal of Translational Sciences. It's a study of 666 homeschooled children. They compared 261 unvaccinated with 405 partially or fully vaccinated. 
So this is the only published study that I know of that actually compares those two. And there's a whole bunch of different categories, so maybe I won't read them all, but I'll read some of them. Vaccinated children had a fourfold likely increase in autism. Vaccinated children had a 34-fold more likely to be diagnosed with allergic rhinitis or hay fever. Vaccinated children 22-fold more likely to require an allergy medicine. Vaccinated children were five-fold more likely to be diagnosed with a learning disability, 340% more likely to be diagnosed with ADD or ADHD. Vaccinated children were 5.9-fold more likely to be diagnosed with pneumonia. Vaccinated children were 3.8-fold more likely to be diagnosed with middle ear infections. Vaccinated children were 700% more likely to have ear, ear tubes uh, put in than unvaccinated and two and a half times more likely to be diagnosed with any chronic illness than unvaccinated. So that's the best answer we have right there. I, of course, have my own personal experience as a doctor for 40 years, which was most of the children in my practice that based on their own choice didn't vaccinate. And I rarely saw people with children with chronic illness. I interviewed Michelle Perro about the book she wrote with Vince Ann Adams. The book is called What's Making Our Children Sick? In terms of coverage of territory, she's covering, trying to answer the question of why do, very much the kind of question you're trying to to, to answer, why do we see this dramatic increase in chronic and autoimmune diseases? And what she points to is industrial agriculture and the use in particular of Roundup. She does not make a claim that this is the only cause, but it raises the issue for me of multiple causes because it makes me think, well, what is, okay, vaccines are a problem, Roundup is a problem, and other toxicants uh, industrial toxicants. I just want to stop you for one minute here. Sure. Because there is without any doubt, and I would refer any listener to the work of Stephanie Seneff, who's yep. a senior researcher at MIT, yep. that there are numerous vaccines, most particular MMR, which contain uh, testable amounts of Roundup in them. And the reason for that is because they're often grown on collagen, which is made by, from, you know, commercially grown industrial agriculture animals who are eating industrial raised uh, hay and silage or whatever else they eat, which is all uh, massively contaminated with Roundup. There is glyphosate, which is the active ingredient in Roundup. And then there is Roundup with all of the other inactive ingredients, so-called, but which uh, when they actually do toxicological studies of this, that Roundup itself, the whole package is actually more toxic, has greater impact than glyphosate by itself. So yeah. the reason that I that I brought this up is that we have call it environmental exposures and even though we may not think of a vaccine as an environmental exposure it is. And I think that antibiotics are an environmental exposure as are electromagnetic fields. I don't have an answer, but it seems like there are multiple causal pathways leading to this increase in chronic illness. And I am curious to know what your thoughts are on that perhaps broader issue and how what you have discovered and have thought through. And for instance, you cite the works of Gilbert Ling and Gerald Pollack about how cells actually work and what that may tell us about how environmental exposures cause this increase in autoimmune and chronic illnesses. You're listening to Your Own Health and Fitness. I'm Jeffrey Fawcett. I'm talking today with Thomas Cowan, MD, about what explains the dramatic rise of autoimmune diseases and chronic illness in children. Right. I, I, I've never said that vaccines are the only thing that causes no, no. the increase. Um, and in fact, just to put some numbers on it, the head of the uh, Krieger Kennedy Center for N Neurology or something for children at Johns Hopkins, the director who used to be 
you know, the the government's main wit, sort of legal expert or expert witness on the lack of connection between vaccines and autism because of a personal experience now has turned turned his, his opinion and is now saying that a, about 40 percent of the vaccinated of autism, which is about 400,000 children, is due to vaccines. Uh, now, that means 60 percent are not. That means there's other exposures. And for instance, anything that facilitates um, inflammation in your gut that makes holes in your intestinal wall, uh, like glyphosate does, and some of the excipients or whatever, whatever you call them, other ingredients in Roundup, many of which, interestingly, are the same as in vaccines, you know, polysorbate 80 and all these other crazy names, which you don't know what, you know, antifreeze and all, they show up in vaccines. They facilitate the absorption of antigens into your bloodstream, which then gets in certain people that gets them to react to that and sets off this whole chain of events through something called molecular mimicry. And I can imagine that you know, I have a, a good friend who wrote the book Electronic Silent Spring, which is oh, about yes. uh-huh. the EMF connection with this. Yeah, Katie Singer. Yeah, I mean, I've known Katie Singer for 25 years. So I, I am no means trying to discount that we live in a crazy world. And this way of life, uh, this food, this electromagnetic field, the the way we talk to people and the, just the sort of uh, mind pollution, I'm not sure what the right word is, but we live in an atmosphere of lies and fallacies and, and it's just a toxic soup. And I'm amazed that the children do as well as they do. I agree with you very strongly. Sometimes I step back and say, God, I'm shocked that it's not worse than than it is. I mean, I'm really surprised that these little bodies just carry on and thrive as well as they do. It's, it, it astounds me. It is amazing. And it's a, a testimonial to the re- resilience in spite of, I mean, we, we shouldn't lose sight of the fact, you know, when people say, well, um, something about uh, it, you don't, we don't know whether it's good to have measles or not. The fact of the matter is, I know in everybody, according to the CDC, born before 1956, which happens to be the year that I was born, so I remember it, is considered immune for life from measles, which means that anybody 64 or older had measles as a child, which therefore means we don't even know if you can be in a, like live to 80 without having had measles. I mean, probably you can. And I'm sure some people have, but we don't know the population effect of that, of not having gone through childhood diseases on 70 year olds, because there hasn't ever been 70 year olds who didn't who didn't go through that. Never. This is an experiment that has never happened before. And if you're somebody who thinks, oh, well, what could go wrong? I mean, we must know about this. I mean. You know, I, they, they, I don't know. I, I mean, I, we could probably both list a dozen times where we were told by experts, don't worry, like thalidomide and, you know, DDT yeah. and mm-hmm. you know, on and on and on. Don't worry, it's safe. We used to, you know, sprinkle DDT on, on the children's clothes and their hair before they went to school because you know, they could get bitten by a fly or something. I mean, (laughs) that didn't work out very well. And we have a long history of that. So I think, personally, I'm always careful with, if it's never happened before, I'm not so sure I believe the theory is correct. One of the things that comes up in Michelle Perrault's book, you mentioned it as well, is the the effect on, on the gut of glyphosate and to key off of that some, you talk extensively in, 
in your book, which is vaccines, autoimmunity, and changing nature of childhood disease. The microbiome, that is our commensal organisms, the organisms that we share an ecology with, that happens to be housed in our gut, plays an extremely important role in both immunity and autoimmunity. It would be helpful for you to, I think, for uh, listeners to hear you talk about about that role of, of the gut and gut health generally. As I'm sure you know, and probably your listeners know, we have you know seven to eight pounds of bacteria or, or microorganisms living in our gut. We have more bacterial or microorganisms living in our gut than we have human cells in our body, which then is, of course, a metaphysical question of who do you think you are? Because more <laughs> of your genetics is somebody else than it is of you. And the, the role of that microbiome is to create immunity, to digest food, to create a healthy gut blood barrier so things don't leak into your bloodstream that shouldn't be. And we're, we get it when we go through the birth canal. And a lot of times that doesn't happen with C-sections or treatment with antibiotics for group B strep and all kinds of other interventions. And so we're born with a distorted ecology, a distorted gut flora, which doesn't digest the food well, doesn't create immunity well, doesn't protect the gut blood barrier. Things leak into your bloodstream, things being foreign proteins like milk proteins or soy proteins or egg proteins. Uh, those are also injected into your bloodstream through the vaccines. They're also injected along with specific medicines, if you want to use that word, like aluminum that that gets you to overreact to those now absorbed back, uh, foreign proteins. And the repercussion of them is you will overreact and you will end up with the vicious cycle of creating antibodies to eggs, reacting to eggs, uh, creating more antibodies to eggs, reacting to more eggs. And then you have egg allergy, soy allergy, peanut allergy, milk allergy, and all the distress that comes from that for life. And that has a lot to do with the gut flora, which is also disturbed by, you know, not having the right bacteria through the birth canal, bad food, not having uh, probiotic food in your diet like normal people do and have. Uh, taking antibiotics is a main cause of that. We know that the gut flora practically never recovers to its normal state after a course of antibiotics and that probiotics even may not even help with that. So it's just one of those things that creates the conditions of this, this tidal wave of poor health that we're seeing and chronic disease that we're seeing in people and children. Is it possible to maybe not recover from, but at least counter some the effect of vaccination? In the book, I wrote a whole plan on how to rebalance your immune system and use diet, particularly like a version of the GAPS diet, which is basically mm -hmm. a gut restoration program to reintroduce colostrum, which helps to the implantation of the gut flora. I used this uh, medicine uh, by Zach Bush called Restore, which tightens up the junctions. In certain people, I use uh, this medicine called low-dose naltrexone, which has a rebalancing effect of down-regulating the humoral and up-regulating the cell-mediated. So all those things are helpful, and I have you know cases in the book of people having full recovery from even the worst autoimmune disease, and I have treated hundreds, maybe more patients with that program. But I still can't help but get to the fact that it's always better to prevent that kind of misery than try to treat it once you get it. Do you have any last thoughts on where people go from here about vaccination specifically or the uh, issues around these other environmental exposures? It's a great question. And I mean, my, my role in this, I think, is to just present the information 
and the way of looking at the world that I that I see. I try to do as best I can to create a, you know, personal and research based framework for understanding these things. Now, I'm not a politician. I'm not an environmental activist. Um, I don't know that like a political strategy that one should take or that groups of people should take. I, I tell you, the only thing I can say is I, I'm philosophically, except I would say in, in very certain situations against coercion or the use of force to get people to, to follow an agenda. That just does not sit well with me. And the, the exceptions are what they call an NVC, the protective use of force. In other words, if somebody's going to shoot you, I think it's okay to kick the gun out of their hand because I think that not only helps you not get shot, but it helps the person not shoot somebody, neither of which are good. Um, so I can see a use of, of more force in that situation. I don't see that that's the case with that making people uh, do any medical intervention against their will. I think that goes against fundamental human rights. I think it goes against the principles of the Nuremberg Conventions, which hopefully we've learned something from. Uh, and I just don't see that as a, a, a compatible with a country or a society that values freedom. Now, how people want to try to, uh, if they agree with me, and it, and I think mainly I'm hoping people just look into the information, read my book, read a, you know, other books on it, pro-vaccine, anti-vaccine, who knows about vaccine, childhood illness, Coley's toxins, conventional chemotherapy. Just educate yourself on the issues. Decide for yourself, and then act out of as much of a sense of freedom and integrity as you can muster. I've been talking with Thomas Cowan, MD, about his book, Vaccines, Autoimmunity, and the Changing Nature of Childhood Illness. Thanks for joining us today. Visit our website, yourownhealthandfitness.org, for information about this show and almost 700 other shows, free access to recordings of all of them, a free newsletter about upcoming shows, and more. Your Own Health and Fitness is produced by Lena Berman and Jeffrey Fawcett. Until next time, take care of yourself. Enjoy KPFA's 48th Annual Crafts Fair at the beautiful Craneway Pavilion on the Richmond Waterfront. We'll be broadcasting live Saturday and Sunday, December 22nd and 23rd from 9 a.m. till 11. The fair is open from 10 a.m. to 5. On display, the creations of 200 artists and craftspeople. Admission is $12 for ages 18 to 64. Seniors and disabled, just $8. And youngsters are free. For details, visit CranewayCraftsFair.com. It's a KPFA benefit. KPFA has gone social. Media, that is. Stay connected to all things KPFA by visiting our Facebook and Twitter pages, where you'll be able to get special access to additional news and information from all of your favorite KPFA news and music programs. And make sure to check out KPFA's YouTube channel for never-seen-before musical performances and past KPFA author events. KPFA knows this is your station, and we want you to feel connected to us at all times so we can all continue to stay vigilant as always. And it is near 2 o'clock here at KPFA, 94.1 FM in Berkeley, 
9.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, 97.5 K24APR in 